I don't know if you all saw that fine opportunity that Tim just gave me. He ushered me right on up to the uh, stage here. That's a fine job. Thank you for that, my friend. Now, you all do know that you all are ruining every Baptist one-liner that's out there. Have you all heard the phrase before, like, three drops of rain will keep four Baptists out of church? You all are totally blowing the proportions on that right now. Thank you all for being here tonight, especially on an evening with a lot of rain. Um, in fact, I found myself pretty drenched just kind of walking in from the truck out there, but it was all good. So we're starting with a question that we are going to continue to ask over the next five minutes. Here's the question. What is truth? What is truth? It is the question that Pilate asked Jesus over in John 18. It is a question that has reverberated through the corridors of history. It is a question that is extremely important for us to know how do we know that what we are hearing or what we are reading or what we are listening to or for that matter what we are believing in how do we know that it is factual that it is accurate it is a question of supreme importance because our beliefs will impact more than just us parents your beliefs will directly impact your children but it's not just for parents. Our beliefs as a whole will impact those who are around us. Let me give you a few examples of this. In 1903, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was first published in Russia. And it was said to be a speech that was given by a Zionist leader outlining a secret Jewish plan to achieve world power by controlling international finance and subverting the power of the Christian church. It was a story that spread like wildfire. The manuscript went everywhere. People were outraged by what they read and they heard. That particular piece was used to justify hate campaigns against the Jewish people throughout the 20th century, including the Russian pogroms as well as the Nazi Holocaust. In 1921, journalists discovered that that particular story had been plagiarized from an 1864 work by Maurice Jolly. The original work was an attack against an emperor, Napoleon III. It didn't even mention the Jewish people. But by the time the story came out, the damage had been done. A lie that was widely accepted as truth led to millions of people dying. So what is truth? In the 1980s, Peter Popoff was a prominent TV evangelist. And during his services, he would amaze his listeners many times by sharing personal information about a family's illness or maybe about a family's address or a family's financial situation. And many of his followers looked at that and they believed that he was getting a divine word directly from God. God was speaking to him and through him. But later on, his ministry caught the eye of a magician by the name of James Randi. He heard what was going on, and he decided to do a little investigation. And he found out that Popoff was holding what was in his ear, which looked like a hearing aid. Turned out, it was connected to a shortwave radio. And Popoff was getting information from his wife, who happened to be talking with people coming into the service, reading over their prayer cards, and then she was speaking to him while he was speaking to others. And it turns out the entire thing was a scam. But tens of thousands of people place faith in what they thought to be true. Here's my question. What is truth? In October of 2014, the Economist magazine ran an article citing disturbing trends within research. I want to read this to you, and this, this is by no means the whole article, but this is a major section out of it. I want to read it to you because it is so jam-packed full of pertinent insight that I want you to hear directly from this quote. Here's what it said, and I quote, Modern scientists are doing too much trusting and not enough verifying to the detriment 
of the whole of science and of humanity. Too many of the findings that fill the academic ether are either the result of shoddy experiments or of poor analysis. A rule of thumb, half of published research cannot be replicated. Last year, researchers at one biotech firm, Amgen, they found that they could reproduce just six of 53 landmark studies on cancer research. Earlier, a group at Bayer, a drug company, managed to repeat just a quarter of 67 similarly reported papers. A leading computer scientist frets that three quarters of the papers in his subfield are bunk. In 2000 to 2010, roughly 80,000 patients took part in clinical trials based on research that was later retracted because of mistakes or improprieties. One reason is the competitiveness of science. The obligation to publish or perish has become the rule over academic life. Competition for jobs are cutthroat. Full professors in America earned an average of 135000 a year in 2012, more than what judges did. Every year, six freshly minted PhDs are vying for every one academic position. Nowadays, verification, the replication of another person's results, do little to further or advance a researcher's career. And without verification, dubious findings live on to mislead. The hallowed process of peer review is not all it's cracked up to be either. When a prominent medical journal ran research past other experts in the field, it found that most of the re reviewers failed to spot mistakes it had deliberately inserted into the papers even after the people were told that they were being tested. John Bohannon, a biologist at Harvard, recently submitted a pseudonymous paper on the effects of a chemical derived from lichen on cancer cells to 304 journals describing themselves as using peer review. It was an unusual paper, concocted wholesale and stuffed with clangers in study design, analysis, and interpretation of results. 157 of the journals accepted it for publication. There is no cost to getting things wrong, says Brian Nosek, a psychologist at University of Virginia. The cost is not getting them published. End of quote. So what is truth? For those of you who think that you can rely on the cold, hard facts of science, think again. If you're under the impression that publishers verify all of their findings before it hits the printer, you're sadly mistaken. If you're trusting in the goodness of humanity to do what is best for everyone around them, the Holocaust should silence that forever. For those who think their favorite preacher can do no wrong, just the scandals of the last 10 years would tell us otherwise. So what is truth? For those who have been a part of the church for a period of time, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, there might be a passage coming to your mind. Jesus has said, your word is truth. And we agree with that 100%. Now somebody might say, but if the Bible claims that the Bible is true, isn't that a self-substantiating claim? How do we know that the Bible is true? Listen, this is going to sound strange. You don't. Now, now don't think I've, I've gone off to the side on my theology. I believe 100% the Bible is true. I'm actually building a point here. How do we know it's true? What the Bible says, your word is true. How do we know it's true? It, you don't. Here's what you do. Like every other part of life, whether you're talking about science or history or religion, faith is going to be required. And at the end of the day, here's what we do. We ask the question, where does the evidence lead us? There's plenty of evidence to substantiate the claims that God's word is true. Don't be afraid of somebody questioning the validity or the veracity of the word of God. It'll stand up under any test that's thrown at it. His word is true. Now, in our passage today, the apostle Paul tells us that he received the gospel by direct revelation from Christ. 
It is a proposition of faith, and he absolutely knows it. And the reason I know that he knows this is because he spends the rest of the chapter going through and providing evidence to substantiate the claim that he just made. Now, we're going to investigate not only his statement, but his claims, the evidence that he gives over the next several weeks. We're going to be asking difficult questions about divine revelation. What is it? Who receives it? Is divine revelation still something that is occurring at this time? There's a lot that we're going to cover, and tonight we're just getting into two verses of this. So I invite you to go with me in your Bibles once again. Book of Galatians, chapter number 1. We're going to be in verses 11 and 12. I'm teaching this evening on the subject, what is truth? What is truth? Here's what the text says. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may your spirit guide us into truth. God, may we we walk away with a greater certainty of your word. May our faith be strengthened this evening. And Lord, may you protect us from falling into error. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to briefly give you all two basic truths from this text that are applicable to every single person who is in the room and everybody who is watching online. I'm going to spend the rest of our time this evening going through and some, I guess, addressing some of the controversial pieces that are related to divine revelation. But here's here's the first truth that I want you to see out of the text. That is, the gospel is divine revelation, not a man-made message. The gospel is divine revelation, not a man-made message. I want you to look at one of the phrases that we find right here in verse number 11. He says, I would have you know. That that little phrase right there, it, it comes from a strong Greek verb. It means to make known with certainty, to certify something. In our vernacular today, it would be the equivalent of somebody say, let me make this perfectly clear to you. Whatever's on the other side of this, they're wanting you to know this is, this is clear, this is certain, this is right here for you. So what's on the other side? What is he wanting to make perfectly clear to the readers who are in Galatia? He says, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. That's the first thing he wants them to know. He goes on to say, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He wants them to know that the gospel message came by divine revelation. It is not a man-made message. Now, the word revelation, it speaks of an unveiling of something that was previously secret. A Christ is the source of the gospel, and revelation is the means of transference. It is the way in which this revelation came out. It's the way in which the gospel was presented. He tells us that he did not learn the gospel from man. That's important. He tells us that he did not read it. That's important. It wasn't like he picked up a book down at the Christian bookstore, and it talks about like the gospel for dummies. And he picks it up, and he's like, man, this is a fantastic concept. Let me go and begin to share this with others. He's saying this is not a human-made idea. The the idea of the gospel comes from divine revelation itself. Now, his point here is to clearly state that the gospel is not man-made. It is not a man-made message. And if you understand the essence of the gospel, that makes perfect sense. Now, I've gone through a very similar pattern of what is the basic gospel message. Let me hit it again. Here it is. Humanity was created for a relationship with God. Our sins separated us from that relationship. There was nothing that we could do to make things right ourselves. Jesus did what we could not do. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He rose from the grave three days later that we might have life. And he offers eternal life or a reconciled relationship to those who repent of their sin by placing faith in him. That's the gospel message. But let me give you another spin on understanding this. Every way that we can 
present ideas to help put a hook in the gospel so it sticks in your mind. That's what I'm trying to do. So here's another way of saying this. The gospel is the message of God's design, sin's intrusion, and Christ's solution for human flourishing. I'll say that again. The gospel is the story of God's design, sin's intrusion, and Christ's solution for human flourishing. If somebody's asking you, like, what's the gospel about? Those are three simple points that you can share. Here's the basic idea behind it. It's it's that there was a design that God had in the very beginning. Sin interfered with that design. And Jesus shows up and says, here is my plan. Here is what I will do so that you might experience your created purpose. That's the essence behind the gospel. The gospel is all about God and what he has done for us. Had the gospel been a man-made proposition it would be jam-packed full of ideas permeated with works-based righteousness. The reason I say that is because that's what you find in every other major religion around the world. Every other religion that you're looking at, it is going to be filled with these are things that you must do and or believe in order to be approved or to be made right with God or the gods or with the universe. So if you were to look in Islam, you're going to find in Islam, it's going to talk about the five pillars of Islam. In Buddhism, you're given the four noble truths and the eightfold path. In Eastern mystic religions, you're to take a pilgrimage or use a Tibetan prayer wheel or you are to fast five times a week or you're to recite a mantra or you are to give to the poor, give alms to the poor. Maybe you're supposed to do good in order to offset your bad. Every single one of these is you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's this is what I have to do in order to be right with God or the gods. And then here comes the message of the gospel. There's nothing you can do. And it is an offense against the sinful pride of humanity. We don't like thinking that our our soul, our, our being is contingent upon a merciful God to act on our behalf and do what we cannot do ourselves. We like to be able to figure things out and to make it work. And we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we're going to do it. The gospel says, you can't do this. The gospel is all about God. Here's the next one. Divine revelation was not extended to everyone. I want you to notice the number of personal pronouns that are used in verses 11 and 12. The gospel, which was preached by me, this is Paul talking, is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul received direct revelation personally. Now, it is one thing for a person to claim divine revelation from God. It is another thing to prove that they received divine revelation from God. Many people have claimed that they have received divine revelation. Joseph Smith founder of Mormonism, believed he received divine revelation. Jim Jones believed he received divine revelation. Mary Baker Eddy of Christian Science said she received divine revelation. That's how many cults and schisms and fringe groups get started is people say, I've received a revelation from God. I have truth that you do not have. I know something. God spoke directly to me. So here's my question. Let's play devil's advocate on this for just a moment. And if you're talking to your lost friends, I guarantee you they will play the same game with you. So here's my question. Why do we think that the apostle Paul received divine revelation, and Joseph Smith did not. Why do we believe that Paul received this and maybe Jim Jones did not? What's our criteria on this? Here's the thing. We go back to the evidence. Many times you have to come at it from the perspective of an attorney. 
You have to look and say, where's the evidence leading in this? The one thing that every false prophet fears is someone investigating their claims. The Apostle Paul not only welcomes the investigation, he gets them started on the process of evidence. He didn't expect people to just believe him because he said it. Instead, he goes back and like, and let me give you several ways so that you know that what I'm saying is true. And over the next 12 verses, all the way through the end of the chapter, he gets them started. This is the evidence. Here's the evidence. Here's the evidence. We get into the evidence more this next week. But let's go a step further in this. It's one point for us to say not everybody receives divine revelation. Not everyone, as we know, was chosen to write different letters or books that are found in the Bible. We understand that, but here's where it gets really, really personal. When anyone, and I'm saying pastors, priests, Christian leaders, best friends, authors, friends, when anyone says, God told me, let the caution bell start to go off in your mind. Now, let me be clear. The question is not, does God still speak? We understand God speaks through his word. The Holy Spirit leads and guides his people. God will prompt us to act. God convicts us of sin. We understand that God will often use circumstances many times to direct us and to put us on the right path. God is still leading his people. In fact, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. There, there is a part of God's leading that still happens to this day. The question is not, does God speak? The question is, how do you know it's God? How do you know that what you just heard is a prompting from God and not your own conscience? How do you know it's God and not the enemy trying to lead you down the wrong path? How do you know it's God and not the voices of those who are your circle of influence how do you know that what you're hearing is from God here's here's your key piece to take away with tonight check what you heard against what God said check what you heard against what God said check what you heard against what God said if it does not align with scripture it's not of God now here's the other side of that you have to know scripture to know it. Oh, now I'm meddling at this point. If you don't know the Word of God, if you're not studying it, if you're not allowing it to sink down into the deepest parts of who you are, many times you're setting yourself up to be deceived. We have to know the Word ourselves. Jesus says in John 17, 17, your Word is truth. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, we we heard last week that the Bereans, they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, examine everything carefully, hold fast to what is good. Examine everything carefully. Revelation 2, 2, I, I love this one. God commends the church at Ephesus by saying, I know your deeds, and you put to test those who called themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. In other words, good job. You put them to the test. What did they do? They, they compared and checked what they heard with what God said. That's the method that we still have to use to this very day. So let's stop there, and let's take it back another layer. What did they do before Scripture was written? We get a chance to now look at 66 books that are found in our Bible, and we get a chance to check what we hear against what God said. But hold on just a moment. What did they do when the second part of your Bible was not yet finished? How did you know? How did did they know that what Paul said was true or what Peter said was true? Oh, here's one. What do you do before you get the first section in? How did they know that before it was canonized? Now, I'm not going to get into all the specific pieces of the canonization process, but let me give you this basic idea. Here's what happened in that. The people looked for what they referred to as marks of divinity. That is, did the message resound with the authoritative voice of God? 
Was it written by someone who was recognized as being sent from God? Was the individual's life and message, was it validated by signs or wonders or by profound wisdom? Those were the basic pieces they were looking at. So let's begin to work this out just a little bit. Think about for a moment Moses. Now let's say somebody was on the fence with Moses. Is he from God? Mm -hmm. Is he not? I don't know what to think of this guy. He shows up out of the middle of nowhere. He came from a life of privilege. Can we really believe him? Now, here's the thing. If you're on the fence about that, and all of a sudden the plagues hit Egypt, that probably needs to sway some things towards his favor. When the Red Sea opens, that's a great moment. Water from a rock, amen, brother. When the earth opens up and swallows his enemies, I'm a follower. Here to, the, there's those divine moments that came along that validated what he was saying. That, that's the way in those early days God used those pieces in order to begin to lay the foundation for what is the word, what is the truth, how do we know that we can believe what has been presented before us. So we find there were visual validations that go along with the message. So when it came to the prophets when it came to what was taking place over in the New Testament, we would find that there were pieces that were put in place from the Old Testament that helped people understand the importance of some of these initial roles. So let me give you a couple of examples of this. In Jeremiah, you might want to write these two references off to the side. Jeremiah 28, verse 9. It says, The prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord, only if his prediction comes true. That's pretty good. Deuteronomy 18.20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. So if a prophet spoke, and what they said did not happen, as they said it was going to happen. They were not a prophet of God, and they were to die. Okay, think of some Old Testament conversations. Have you guys seen or heard anything from Prophet Harold recently? <laughs> oh, you didn't hear, did you? No, what was that? Well, you remember last week when he said God was with us and we were going to win that battle? Yeah wasn't entirely true we lost so we stoned him I mean if what they said did not come true as they spoke it they were to die you talking about a difficult business you talking about something that would shut down the airways quick if everything that was spoken did not come true as it was spoken and somebody was going to die on the other side it'd probably be a lot more silent out there now, all kidding aside here, being a prophet was hard. But listen, prophecy, divine revelation was crucial for God revealing himself to humanity. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Prophecy was inspired speech. God's message became God's word. So once the Old Testament scriptures were set, it became the baseline of truth for what we find in the New Testament. But in the New Testament, there's now two very specific positions that are mentioned here. That is the apostles as well as the prophets when it comes to establishing the books and establishing truth in the New Testament. Now, I shared this about apostles maybe a couple of weeks ago. But the word apostle, it means one who is sent with a commission, an envoy, an ambassador, a messenger. For somebody to be an apostle, there were two prerequisites based upon what we find in Acts chapter 1. They had to be an eyewitness to the ministry of Christ and they had to be chosen by the risen Lord for the position itself. It's through the apostles that the New Testament was written and proclaimed. Now here's where it moves over into the prophets. It's through the prophets 
that the word was repeated, it was taught locally, and it was held up as the source of truth. If you want a reference for this, go over to Ephesians 2.20, and here's what it says. The church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and the prophets. Now, believe me, we're all coming back to this idea of what is truth and why it is that we can trust that what the apostle Paul has said is truth. Why it's important that he said, what I received was not of man. What I received came to me by divine revelation by Christ himself. So the apostles and the prophets were foundational positions within the early church. Once scripture was established, once the church had an accurate way of being able to determine what is and what is not true, as best we can tell through the scriptures, the positions of apostle and prophet ceased to exist. Now, why would I say that? Let me give you several references for this. Scripture refers to these men and their contributions in the past tense. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, Jude verse 17. It tells believers to remember the words spoken beforehand by the apostles and the prophets, past tense. In Jude verses 3 and 4, it tells believers to contend for the message that was once for all handed down to the saints, past tense. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it speaks of those who heard from God and performed signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. It speaks of all of those in past tense. Now, here's where the controversy begins. In some of Paul's pastoral epistles, he refers to positions within the local church. He tells you about those positions. He tells you how they're to function. He tells you about the requirements for somebody to be in that position. So he lists out things in that text. He talks about elders or pastors, one grouping, teachers and deacons. He does not mention apostles. There is a movement right now that's been taking place for a number of years within the church to restore what is referred to as the five-fold ministry of the church that will include apostles and prophets. Now, adherence to this would look back, and their proof text is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. Here's what the text says. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, while I understand 100% that Ephesians chapter 4 is there, it is in the Bible, it is clear, no question about it, here's what I want to contend with. You have to go through Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 to get to Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. And it is in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 that it says the apostles and the prophets are described as foundational. God used those positions to reveal his word, to write his word, to teach his word, and to provide a baseline of truth. Once the foundation is laid, you don't have to lay it again. Now, depending upon your denominational background, where you've come from, the journey that you've been on, you might be trying to, I guess, interweave what I'm sharing tonight with maybe what you've heard or what you've learned or maybe even what you watched last night. Because last night you might have been, you know, watching Prophet Harold or Prophetess Benita or, you know, some other apostle. And you're like, hold on just a moment. If those positions ended 2,000 years ago, who was I watching last night? I don't know. I don't. Now listen, there are some, some people who will assume a title with no malice in their heart. They're not trying to deceive anyone. It's the context that they're from. This is, this is what they've seen. This is what they've heard. And sometimes, I will say, sometimes... It definitely seems a lot more fun if you're an apostle or a prophet. I mean, 
why be Pastor Paul if I can be Apostle, Doctor, Prophet, <laughs> Pastor Paul? I mean, that's a title with some zing behind it. So I think sometimes it's just the position sounds more formal. It sounds more important. And I, listen, I don't want for a moment to say everybody who has a title like that is using it incorrectly for the purpose of trying to mislead others. That's not it. But here's what I am trying to be very, very clear about. There are some who have assumed the title, listen, 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 use it to claim divine revelation and then want others to give them the authority of the original office that's found in the New Testament. That's where the concern comes in. How do you know that what you're hearing is true? Let me give you some verses as we close. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Don't you love the fact that what we're facing today is nothing new? 2,000 years, this has been an issue that the church has had to address. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Here's another one. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. All this is key. You will know them by their fruits. Jesus not only warned against false prophets, he said, here's how you can spot them. Do their life, does their life, does their actions Oh, oh, watch this. Does it match the character of God? Why is that so important? Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. For false Christ and false prophets will arise, and here it is, and perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The enemy will give enough power in order to allow people to do what needs to be done in order to deceive the masses. If your criteria is, can the person perform a miracle, that is a bad criteria for spotting a false prophet. That might have been a part of how God walked the process out before the word was here, but now that the word is here, we now have an opportunity to check what they're saying, how they're living against what the word of God has already declared. And a person is known by the fruit of their life. So now we get a chance to see, does the person's life match the character of God? Does it match the word of God? And if not, get away quick. Nobody likes to be lied to. No one wants to look back and say, I wasted the last 10 years of my life because I didn't ask the hard questions up front. Ask the hard questions now. How do we know truth? Know the word. How do we know truth? Know the son. Remember, everything God desires to do in and through your life, he will accomplish out of the overflow of your relationship with him. The further you pursue Jesus, the more you know truth. As you pursue him, he'll lead you through his word. As you're in the word, you grow in the knowledge of who he is and how he acts and where his heart is. Why is it so important that you're evaluating what you're seeing and what you're hearing against the character of God? Because if you're spending time with God, you get to know his character. You get to know his heart. You get to know his passions. You get to know how he moves and what he's doing. It doesn't mean that we know everything about God, but it does mean that the further you walk with him, the more you get to know him. Just keep pursuing Jesus. Isn't it wonderful 
that I don't have to say, pursue Jesus and go get a PhD in theology right now. Just keep pursuing Jesus, and here's what you'll find. He has an unbelievable way of allowing his spirit to convict you at the right time to say, what you're hearing is the wrong thing. Stop and walk away. And when that happens, here, here, here's the other side, obey. <laughs> don't say, mm, I don't know, it sounds pretty good. No, don't do that. When the spirit of God brings conviction, stop and say, Lord, how would you have me to respond? Check what you've heard against what he said. Now, tonight, we come to the end of verses 11 and 12. I know, by 2035, we will be right through this book. <laughs> it's going to be awesome on the other side, I'm telling you. You're going to know you some Galatians by the time we're done. Here's the, the funny part. I look at this, and I'm like, well, I have enough time to get through two verses on a Sunday night. And sometimes that's a real question right there. But I want us to take our time going through. I want you to see how beautifully perfect the Word of God is. I want you to have such a deep love. Oh, mm, mm. okay, here it is, here it is, here it is. Okay, I was taught by a mentor years ago. It's going to sound strange, but he said, don't teach people to love the Word of God. Teach them to love the God of the Word. If they love the God of the Word, they will inevitably love the Word of God. Just keep pursuing Him. Chase after Him. He guides you into all truth. If you have not already seen, starting in the month of September, we have the book of the month. I already saw some people had a copy of the book. It's in the bookstore. And here's why we're doing this. We want to encourage ongoing pieces that come in alignment with the messages that you're receiving. So this upcoming month, it's the Indwelling Life of Christ by Major Ian Thomas, a classic work that describes the Christ life. You want to get a copy of this book. And also, starting in this month, there is a verse of the month. This one should be familiar. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. We spent five weeks in this particular section right there. It's a good time to memorize it. Let's pray as we close out. By the way, have y'all noticed the rain stopped? Aren't you glad you didn't let the rain keep you out of church tonight? <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the fact that your word is sufficient, it is complete, it is powerful. God, we thank you for all that you continue to do Today, as we finish out this day of being together with the body of Christ, may we have a deeper passion to love you and to pursue you than we've ever had before. God, meet with us early in the morning. Lord, may your word come alive. God, may we continue to see your activity around us. And Lord, we will be so careful to give you praise and glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You all have a wonderful rest of your night.